Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Making Action Happen. I'm Sarah Blackhurst. And I'm Brian Dean McCain. Real <laughs> middle name that time. No fake middle name. He's he's getting tired of me interjecting a made-up middle name. Um, so, yeah, it is Dean McCain. So we've got an uh, important uh, episode for you today. Of course, you know we're in toward the last weeks of the Colorado legislative session. That legislative session is mm-hmm. 120 days long. There are there's a bill that's been introduced and a bill that's getting ready to be introduced that we want to talk about um, today. And I'm going to introduce our guests. So I want to um, turn the time over to both of you. So will you start for our listeners and for and for folks who may not know who each of you are? Lauren, can we start with you? And can you just tell us about you and about your why you're doing what you're doing and mm-hmm. and your organization? Thank you, Sarah. I'm Lauren Furman. I'm the president and CEO of the Colorado Chamber of Commerce. The Colorado Chamber of Commerce represents several thousand businesses of all sizes, of all industries across the state. We also represent over 50 local chambers of commerce and about 48 trade associations. So we really have the voice of business statewide. And that my goal is to represent their interests down at the state capitol and making sure that we're protecting their interests when it comes to the legislation that we're going to be talking about here. It's a lot of chambers and it's a lot of responsibility. Um, And we were talking earlier, just like me, you have to be considering all industries, all the impacts, how everything fits or doesn't fit together. Um, And so um, my respect and affection to you, Lauren, for that work. Dan, you and I have known each other for several years. Ever since I started, you've been um, You've been active and uh, standing up for our state and protecting our state. Will you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your organization? Sure, and thanks for having me on. Uh, My name is Dan Haley. I'm the president and CEO of the Colorado Oil and Gas Association. We're a statewide trade association with about 250 members that represents the entire value chain of oil and gas in in Colorado. So those upstream producers who are – we're getting the oil and gas out of the ground, the midstream companies that are sending it down to the refinery, the refinery, uh, some utility companies, anybody involved in the energy sector in Colorado is invited to be a member of COGA. Our job is, is much like Lauren's and yours to advocate for these important industries or excuse me, these important businesses that are the you know backbone of our, our country and our, our nation and to ensure that they can continue to operate here in Colorado. We've got a lot of rules in our state. So our operators and members know they have a very high bar to meet to work here in Colorado, but the bar continues to move and shift and get raised and and change. And so we try to figure out exactly what's happening at the state, figure out how we can work through all the different rulemakings that are out there, the new legislation that's coming, so we can continue to produce this vital resource that we all need every single day. And and just so our listeners know, um, oil and gas, you know, it contribute contributes a little bit to the economy of Colorado, right? <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, it's about a twenty seven billion dollar industry, according to the University of Colorado report that came out in December of last year. So a huge part of our economy in the state. There are a lot of activist groups out there right now that are trying to minimize that, producing different reports showing that you know uh, the the value isn't the same. This is considered a primary uh, employer in Colorado. So for every one job that's created or exists in the in the oil field or the gas patch, two or three are created elsewhere in the economy because that job exists or to help support that job. So, again, important, uh, important jobs that are are key to our our state's economic success. And just out of curiosity, what does that uh, what's a tax contribution um, to the state? From your industry, so that varies, yeah, that varies every year, but it's about a billion dollars in state and local taxes, and those go back into our communities primarily to pay for things that we value: libraries, recreation centers, hospitals, uh, etc. And there's very there's various buckets of these tax dollars. About six hundred million goes to K twelve education every year. Another two hundred seventy five million comes back through something called energy impact grants which can go across the state. So you don't even need to be in an oil and gas producing county and you can receive money in these energy impact grants. For example, Leadville helped restore the Tabra Opera House using an energy impact grant. There are new fire trucks on the Western Slope that are paid for through these energy impact grants. It goes across the state. So that's uh, in addition to the taxes, that is um, the community benefit from the industry, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I I would also 
should point out that our members are really active corporate citizens as well. We try to quantify every year about how much our members are putting out, but it's in the tens of millions of dollars each year, more than 50,000 uh, volunteer hours served by industry employees at nonprofits across the state. Wow. So, and you have, you've had to become so battle hardened in the last few years. I, I wonder, uh, I've often wondered what keeps you doing what you do, Dan. Well, your battle hardened is a, a great, great term. It seems like we are always uh, on the menu, but uh, again, my goal is to be at the table and what keeps us going and what motivates us and gets us into work every day is we really believe in what our members do every day. We understand the importance that it has on our community. Oil and gas is the underpinnings of our modern life. Everything that we we use throughout the day, like our cell phones, clothing, all begin in a barrel of oil, all made possible from natural gas. So one, the, the product is vitally needed for our livelihoods, for our success in the 21st century. And then you begin to look at the broader energy security argument. And you see what's happening across the globe when countries like Germany transition too quickly to renewables. They shut down their nuclear plants. When you see Russia invades other countries to establish energy dominance through military dominance, you begin to understand how important it is that we produce this resource not only here in the United States, but we do it here in Colorado, where we believe we're doing it cleaner, better, and safer than most anywhere on the planet. That's what drives us. That's what the reason we come to work every single day is because we believe in that mission. We believe what our members are doing are crucial and, and critical to, to our livelihoods in the 21st century. I'm so glad you brought that up as I've looked at the legislation that's come out, not just this year, but in previous years. Uh, we have a lot of conversations internally about energy security or insecurity um, and how important it is that Colorado takes a very innovative stand um, and a very innovative approach so that we can um, ensure that in a clean and um, moral way, really. Responsible. Responsible. I think it's more than just responsible. I think it's um, – and it is responsible, but it's also – the right thing to do and the right approach. So let's um, let's backtrack just a little bit and talk about um, 1294, and then we're going to talk about this utility bill that we're that we're hearing um, is coming out that we've seen some drafts of. So Lauren, can you um, unpack a little bit um, on this? Because so let me say this: there's provisions in both of these bills. And Lauren heard from me yesterday when I called her, I was pretty hot about it. So I'm trying to just tone it down because we like to give um, the benefit of the doubt on legislation. And I'm really, I'm really honestly having a very difficult time doing this. There's some provisions of this bill that are terrifying in my, um, in my opinion, but beyond, beyond that, I I try to say, you know, what burden or what what's what problem is this a solution to? Um, what's the intent of the bill? So we'll get into the intent of of 1294, which is the um, pollution measures. It's the HB 1294, the pollution protection measures. Pollution concerning protection measures to protect communities from pollution. Yeah, this is this is hyperbole. Okay, go. <laughs> Lauren, tell us what you think. Oh, I just, I got so mad. I just broke this thing. Oh, no. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, it is broadly called the Air Pollution Measures Bill. Um, there was no stakeholding on this bill. We now call that the fake holdering process, not the stakeholdering <laughs> process. <laughs> Down at the state oh, I'm stealing oh. that. <laughs> and the brief explanation of the bill is that it requires pollution modeling simulations for different categories of permits um, and indirect air pollution sources that the department broadly determines to be large indirect air pollution sources of ozone pollutants. The problem with this bill, and I know, and um, my dear friend Dan is deeply impacted, his industry is deeply impacted by this legislation, but it has very broad implications uh, across the state for um, for different industries across the state. We have a list of over 40 opponents um, just in the last couple hours that continues to build um, that extend from the agricultural industry 
to manufacturers to hotels. So we're talking about a very large impact of what this bill does. Um, trucking industry, um, utilities, agriculture, bakeries, dry cleaners, manufacturers, steel mills, anybody could be impacted by this legislation. The I think the big concern that we also have as the uh, State Chamber of Commerce, it is, seems that the sponsors are ignoring all of the work that already has been done on air quality permits and Yet they seem to think, well, this is a bill that we need to offer because the state has not gone far enough. The governor just issued a directive to cut ozone causing NOx by 50% by the year 2030. But yet this bill doesn't recognize that step that the governor has, that directive the governor has made. And so has there been any work towards that directive, just out of curiosity? Um, Dan, you can probably answer that uh, on behalf of the industry. Industry has been working toward that goal of reducing our NOx emissions already. And then the governor just sort of upped the threshold of what we have to meet by 2025 and and then 2030. There would be a rulemaking uh, probably next year on that directive to figure out how we'll go about meeting those goals. If this bill were to pass, it would likely push back all of the different rulemakings we've already been undertaking that are undertaken right now in order to deal with this particular piece of legislation. So um, if he's already done that, why, what do you think the intent of this bill is? I think the proponents don't feel like it goes far enough right now and not too, not soon enough. I think that's a nice way to say it. And I appreciate you saying (laughs) that. Um, I think, I think this is, um, the, the underlying intent, whether anybody's going to say it or not, is to do damage, to do damage to the work that's already been done, um, you know, kind of a temper tantrum, but also to do damage to any industry because this is pretty far reaching. There's um, – can we go back for just a second? Um, can anybody tell me what a um, modeling – I don't even know what that is. It says modeling for what I, – I don't know what that means. So I'd be happy to. So uh, there's a lot in in this bill. And as Lauren pointed out, it impacts a lot of of industries. Clearly, oil and gas is the focus of the bill, but they went much broader than that, included all these different industries. And what they've done is essentially they, they want to change the sort of permitting sequencing that's happening at the statehouse. And my opinion is you've got activist groups out there who are unhappy that we continue to get permits in oil and gas after 181. And so now they're trying to end that in a different way. And so this is a very basic, this is not even going to modeling yet. This is just on the permitting sequencing. And this is a kind of a a basic, probably, I don't know if I should use this analogy or not, but I keep looking at it from a standpoint of when you go to a fast food place and the lines break off into two lines and there's one that's moving, but it's moving kind of slow. And there's one that's not moving at all. They want us to be in that line that doesn't move at all, and there's really no way to get out of it. So if to further that fast food analogy, what happens is you get frustrated and you pull out and you take off and you go someplace else. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what would happen here, right? Because you've got the COGCC over here who's working on the permitting issues. We've been able to figure out over the last couple of years ways to apply these high standards they set during 181 find permits that work for them to be protective of public health, safety, welfare, of the environment. This would move us over to the AQCC where there's up to a year and a half backlog to get an air permit before we could ever go into the COGCC and work on getting that permit, that permit. So when you get into modeling and monitoring, the difference between monitoring and modeling, monitoring is actually using data that comes in on air and determining what you're emitting, what you need to reduce it by, you know, are you meeting these thresholds? Modeling is a different deal altogether where you you use models to determine what you might be emitting later. It's not as effective in our, there's a, there's a time and a place for modeling. It's not as effective as actual monitoring through this. And they include everybody in this again. So it's not just oil and gas, which is what we believe it will grind that permitting process to a halt. I think the state agencies, if they testify to this, we'll say, we can't do this. We're going to need tens, you know, dozens, hundreds of employees to meet the the specifications that are in this bill. And again, 
Um, what are you trying to solve? Are you trying to reduce air emissions to clean the air? I would argue, and I got raked over the coals on Twitter for this last week, but I would argue that if you're reducing the energy coming out of Colorado and requiring us to rely on other states or foreign countries for our energy, you're gonna make the air quality issue worse in Colorado based on how we're producing this resource right now. And it's gonna make it very difficult to meet the governor's NOx reduction uh, directives or standards because of that, right? And then how do you get um, investment into the state when you're running bills like this? And to get investment into the state allows us to buy the technology, to invest in the technology to meet these goals. I've kind of said a lot there, so no, I'll, no, I'll no. let it. Stand, There's, but. I want to, I want to go back for just a second. But what you're saying to me is that, and what I'm hearing from you is that what will happen is that. Um, Energy production, and we're just talking about energy right now because there's a lot of other things in this, but energy production just in and of itself would get pushed to someplace else that doesn't have our standards, that doesn't have um, Coloradans' interest at heart, that doesn't have um, any energy, perhaps any energy interest at heart. You're going to have, they're going to go someplace else because that's going to be the, the cheapest, most expedient way to do it. So, and they're trying to shut this down. All they're doing is they're pushing off that responsibility, that moral objective off onto somebody else who doesn't hold that same value. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I believe that's exactly what will happen. And I think to, to Lauren's point, it's going to impact more than, than oil and gas as this bill is written. So right this now. modeling is so they're going to what they're doing is they're putting the responsibility of. So this is including bakeries. Uh, I mean, they list everybody that produces anything whatsoever from a bakery or a dry cleaner, all the way up to the energy. Um, the, <laughs> so you're going to put a bakery is going to be responsible for modeling in order to get permitted to be in business. Am, am, is this is this? Am I understanding that correctly? You're both nodding your head. Yes. Yes. It, yeah. It requires. I'm, yes. I'm looking at it. it. Requires pollution modeling simulations for several categories of permits including breweries, manufacturing, data centers, dry cleaners, bakeries, warehouses, distribution centers, rail yards, oil and gas facilities, and any other indirect air pollution sources that the department determines to be a large indirect air pollution source of ozone precursor pollutants. Would there be any opportunity for exemption or grandfathered in for current, say, a steel mill or an aerospace company or a rail test yard? Or is it just everybody? It's this hits everybody all at once. This goes through. Right now, I don't see any exemptions in the bill. There may be some industries that might want to try to exempt themselves, but we haven't heard of any so far. And, and of those industries, the big ones, they're all within 25 miles of where we're sitting in Pueblo right now. Exactly. Yep. Or less. I, including manufacturing for clean energy, um, you know, wind towers. Cream this, in, yeah. this would impact them as yeah. well. I would have to think batteries would be impacted by this. All the things that the people who wrote this bill say that they want would be mm. impacted by this yeah. as well. So I want to get think, into you know, sitting. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Dan. I was just going to say sitting in, in Pueblo or down in Southern Colorado where you have a, a company like Evraz, yeah. it's important to note the interconnectedness of our economy. Right. And I think people forget that and people in the legislature forget that when they target one specific aspect of the economy, like oil and gas, they're not thinking about every day, the men and women who show up at Evraz to produce steel pipe, which, by the way, I think most of the steel pipe that we have in the Denver Julesburg Basin in northern Colorado comes straight out of Pueblo into the DJ Basin, into the ground to produce oil and gas, which then goes to Suncor, which then refines it and goes to the Western Slope for retail gasoline, which goes into asphalt. For the, for the state of Colorado, which goes to DIA for jet fuel. And so any one of those things gets disrupted. You disrupt the economy. And I think they forget that when you're very insular and you're kind of in your, your world at the state capitol, hearing from the same people over and over again, you forget the impact that happens across the state when you target any one industry. So and I will just pile on there from what Dan said. We just did a, a statewide tour last week. This is one of the number one issues that has come up in all of the regions across the state, that the legislature continues to move the goalposts on these per, on the permitting process. It's making it harder and harder for businesses to operate here. And I will tell you, 
we are losing our competitiveness as a state compared to other states. We're now number 36 for the cost of doing business in Colorado. And I can rattle off all sorts of other data that is showing that we are, our business climate is deteriorating and we are losing these businesses to Utah, to Texas, to Florida, uh, and the list goes on. So this is just another example of if it is already challenging for that dry cleaner or anyone else to be operating in the state right now, they are looking at other places to locate. Yeah. And Absolutely. that shouldn't be the way it is in, in this state. We've had over the last three years, the rulemakings the state's done on oil and gas have added a minimum, and it's a conservative number, and it's the state's figures, a minimum of $500 million to the cost of doing business in Colorado every single year. That comes at a cost, obviously. And to Lauren's point, when you begin to think like, you don't want to get to a spot where this state is uninvestable, where people look at Colorado and they go, we don't, we, you know, we want to go somewhere else. And I know, you know, we're talking about the broader appeal here, but from an oil and gas standpoint, we can look at what happens in <clears throat> other places like Europe, California. We can see what they have built the roadmap. They are, I, you know, I joke all the time with people from California are coming from the future. And they're telling us what what the future looks like, and we have to listen to them. We don't need to pretend like you know we don't know what's going to happen if you eliminate your ability to produce domestic energy. California decreased their oil uh, production by sixty percent, but didn't inc- didn't decrease their consumption of it. So even the governor Gavin Newsom has said we're now relying on foreign sources for our, our oil, which is not an environmental solution. They have rolling brownouts because they don't have the capacity to support the grid in their state. They're encouraging everybody to buy electric vehicles and then turning around and telling them, but you can't charge it between 4 and 8 p.m. at night because the grid will collapse. It doesn't make any sense. We can have all of these things. We can have the environment that we want and the economy that we need, but we have to work together. And to, now I'm getting fired up, Sarah. You said you were fired up. <laughs> Do it, to, Dan. To Lauren's point, you need to have a stakeholder process. I was in front of a committee last week on a pooling bill and they asked about the stakeholder process. And I said, you know, there was one, but it's not the stakeholder process that we've had in this state for years. And that is to say, I'm proposing a pretty big bill and I'm gonna talk to the industry or industries impacted by it and explain it. And then they can explain the impact. If you do this, these four things will happen. You can still do it because that's your your job is to run and, and pass bills, but you need to know what will happen. That's not what we have anymore. What we have now is a giant Zoom call with 70 people on it, including the activist groups who want to put oil and gas out of business on the call. And they, and they, you know, share either concepts or a bill with you, but it's not a back and forth, sit down, let's hash this out. Let's compromise. Let's try to find something that moves Colorado forward, that meets your goals of lowering emissions, of, of, of making ozone better. And instead, it, and then here we sit with three weeks left proposing major legislation that's going to be decided or voted upon at two in the morning when Coloradans are asleep. So let me, (laughs) I love that you say it's going to be voted on when Coloradans are asleep. I need to back up a little bit for our listeners because unless you're in the arena battling like we all are, you're probably not going to know what stakeholdering is. So stakeholdering is not actually a word and stakeholdering stake doing that process um, is not required is not a statutory requirement in Colorado. But what we mean is Stakeholdering that we have relied on for decades and decades has been weaponized um, to make sure that um, legislation goes through and rulemaking happens without Coloradans knowing what's happening to them. So uh, traditionally, the stakeholdering process was we have a bill. This is what we propose that it's going to solve. This is the solution. This is this bill is our proposed solution to X, Y, Z problem. Um what do you think? You're an industry expert. You're a, a subject matter expert. You um, have the voice of, you know, the voice of your membership, your region, whatever. What is, um, will this work? Will it not work? What are the impacts? And all of that happens often um, before it's even introduced. And I'm going to give you a really good example of a, of a very, very thorough stakeholding stakeholdering that happened a couple of years ago when the governor was getting ready to um, introduce his transportation plan. There was a whole lot of discussion. We went line by line. There was a lot of things that were changed. You know, so they said, this is what I proposed. Nobody was completely happy when it was done, but it was, um, everybody had 
some role to play in that. When I say everybody, it was all the industries, everybody that's touched by that. That is ancient history. We no longer have that. So the stakeholdering where you're asking Coloradans or people that, you know, also represent or have an alternative perspective um, to come and say, how do we make this better? This is, that's what good governance looks like to have that stakeholdering process. This legislature has failed, has failed Coloradans and has failed us when they departed from that strategy of finding out if what they're doing is going to be to benefit or to hurt, to cause burden, to cause damage to Coloradans. I want to bring up a couple. Well, Go ahead. Let me throw this in. All right. when, when we brought this up last year, we talked to two legislators and they said the stakeholdering state, I can't even talk. I can't say it right now. Too much coffee. Um, the stakeholdering process was their election. And I said, yeah. well, you're not up for re-election. You're term limited. And they said, I know. And, and that was the answer that two of these individuals gave me. Yeah. This is what, this is what we're dealing with. There's two more provisions of, or three provisions of this, um, this bill. And then we're going to get into the utility bill that's, um, we've seen the draft of in just a second that I want to bring up. But Brian's very right. This is, uh, this doesn't make <laughs> you crazy. Um, this is part of it. The commission shall adopt rules that require the electrification of all stationary engines unless the operator of the oil and gas operations can demonstrate to the division's satisfaction that electrification of the stationary engines is infeasible. And then it goes on to talk about what would be infeasible. So what, I ha- what would just what would be infeasible? I'm curious of what it says would be infeasible um, for this. Is it money? Is it technology? Is it, it's just not it's possible not, to do this or is it, yeah, you can do this, but it's going to cost $500 million. It's so up, it's feasible, just not possible. It's up. If I'm reading this right and Dan, you can correct me. Um, it's up to the division's satisfaction. So it's a case by case. So you have to go and make your case that it's not feasible. Is that right? Did you read it the same way? What's sort of ironic is the legislature took the words technical feasibility and economic economic practicability out of the Oil and Gas Conservation Act when they passed Senate Bill 181, <laughs> and uh, so they have they haven't had to, they haven't worried whether or not something's technically feasible when they pass rules or or regulations. So now they're adding it back in. So this is this greater push, which a lot of people are interested in, and our members are interested in it, and that is to electrify the oil field to have electric drilling rigs which don't have the same emissions as if you're using diesel. We also have natural gas powered drilling rigs, which bring that emission profile down. And in some cases are as good as the the electric drilling rigs. There are new technologies emerging all the time. I was out on site several months ago looking what they call an e-frac fleet. So as your listeners probably know, hydraulic fracturing is an important part of the oil and gas production process. And uh, they're using batteries now to to frack wells, um, which is great, right? Technology is always changing. We're always investing in it. We want to be innovative. We want to be cleaner and better and, and lean into technology, but it's not always feasible. For example, on the Western Slope, there are no power sources to plug in your electric drilling rig. Don't have 60 mile extension cords, right? <laughs> Um, There are places in the DJ where if you were to plug in an electric drilling rig, the local utility would tell you you're going to brown out our town if you're doing that right now. Right. So in some of these cases, it's not feasible, even if we wanted to do it. The other part of this is these are emerging technologies and these rigs aren't everywhere. So in order to get them into our state, we have to have stability, predictability, certainty. We have to have operators that have permits for the next several years, and they can build out a drilling schedule and get investment into the state so we can bring in the best technology to meet the environmental goals that everybody has has set out. So, for example, the governor's NOx emissions, we are actively trying to figure out how we're going to reach those goals. Moving in that direction, electrification is part of that. But you can't have bills like this at the state house and try to meet those goals in order to get you know, that technology and innovation into our state. So this is the area people are moving into. We've got companies talking about, uh, you know, being, um, you know, zero 
the term I'm missing the the term on zero emissions or yeah. net zero, zero. Net by zero. certain dates, right? So they're all thinking about it and trying to figure out how we can do this. But again, the best way to do it is a collaborative process to figure out how we can, you know, do it together and and know that this is something we're going to keep doing in Colorado, right? And so investors can say, hey, look at this state over here. They've got a set of rules, very tough, stringent rules, toughest in the country, but they're allowing them to work. They're working with operators on how they can best achieve those goals. This is a place to invest, produce clean energy that utilities want, their customers want it. But if you keep introducing bills like this, it makes it very difficult. It, I think it makes it just about impossible. And I think, again, what's the intent of this bill? I wanted, um, Brian reached out to one of our members, um, and I wanted yeah. to get some impact, what what they told you. So they're a, a trash company. Um, they run, you know, around 100 trash trucks, vehicles, roll-offs, that sort of thing. Between He said between 100 and 127, depending on what's broke down. Um, they see this coming, so they're doing the research on just electric trash trucks, like completely impossible right now. Um, you know, a million dollars for one versus two hundred and eighty thousand dollars for one, and then to get an electric fuel truck or uh, electric trash truck serviced, they would have to take it to I think Nevada because nobody can work on it. And he said their trucks break down weekly. Also on that, buying an electric trash truck. You don't actually buy it, you lease it. So it's leasing a truck for two to three years for a million bucks. Um, on that, they they do see this push for mandatory recycling that we're seeing, you know, everywhere. So they invested in in um, expanding to the recycling plant, um, which is desperately needed. In yeah, Southern yeah, Colorado. it's, it's very much needed. needed, and they see that too. And um, they're just playing the game. They, they see what's coming. They want to be relevant in 10 years and, and retire, hopefully, in 15. Uh, mm-hmm. They initially wanted to tap into the grid. The utility company said no, because you will just suck out all the power and power will shut off on in half of Pueblo. So, And there's no infrastructure for it there. So even to build it out, it was like tens of millions of dollars to, to get it working where they're at. Um, so they bought a diesel generator to do this. Um, also the amount of power it takes to power a recycling plant. It's like one day is as much as they spend in one to two months at their transfer stations, not one, but like multiple transfer stations. Um, so he did get the generators and he's seen this and he's like, you know what? I'm not even going to put this together. Not even going to try. They're just going to sit in the back and hopefully I could sell them to somebody out of state soon. Um, on that too, they seeing the writing on the wall, uh, their maintenance trucks, so not the trash trucks, but just kind of their utility trucks. They wanted to do an electric fleet of those of like, you know, 12 to 17. Um, again, they, they care about the environment and they're doing what they can do. And the utility company said, well, we can't even put up charging stations for you. It's just too much to suck on the, the grid right here. So they're trying to go electric and they cannot go electric. Yeah. And I think that those things will come as, a, you know, over time. Yes. Which is also why it's hard to mandate and put years, date certain in, in these things. I had a conversation with the Car Motor Carriers Association a couple of months ago. And maybe the technology has changed on this. But at that time, they were talking about the long haul trucks like the diesel and doing those electric and the batteries are so heavy in those yep. that it changes what you can put the cargo in the back. So for every one big diesel on the road, you'd have two for EVs. Better tailpipe emissions or no tailpipe emissions, but now you've got two giant trucks on the road tearing up the roads, you know, all the different impacts. So there, there are trade-offs in all of these things that we do, which again comes back to that idea of this broader discussion about mutual goals and how we can move forward. Yeah, so, and, Lauren, I don't yeah. mean to jump ahead. No, of you no, 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 you're great. No, I wanted to, I wanted to visit about two more provisions um, on this bill, and I want to get into the next one. Um, I want to talk about the um, litigation piece of this. So, uh, and Lauren, um, because there's so many industries, I wanted you to to um, touch on this. But if I read this right, and you correct me if I'm wrong, um, any individual who feels like you're not or you're adding to the ozone or you're doing air pollution can sue you can sue your business um, that would shut it down. And then no matter the outcome of the litigation, you're still the respondent is going to be responsible for all of the legal fees and whatever else the judge deems and they're, you know, on top of that. So you are, you can get sued 
just for being in business because somebody has a feeling that you're doing whatever. They don't like you if they're competition. doesn't matter. They can sue you. And you're going to, and it'll shut your business down, and you're going to be responsible for whatever legal fees, regardless of the outcome. Did I read that correctly? You were absolutely correct. Private right of action by any citizen. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that it would pop into a bill like this because we're seeing it in almost every piece of legislation now. Yeah. Normally, it's in the labor and employment space. We have 20, 30 bills that deal with some private right of action, some litigation um, provision. But why not put it in here too, right? And I go, I want to go back to our, our state rankings. We have dropped, our legal climate rankings have dropped from 16 to 21. Again, trial lawyers are starting to win. Oh, and yeah. So we got to start turning this tide back and pressing back on some of the things like this. This has got to come out. Well, the bill needs to die. The bill needs to die. More offensive as it gets worse. And we do want, need to talk too about the, the VMT language. Thank you. That was the other part that, so yeah. this, okay, let me, let me give some context for this. This is a vehicle miles traveled reduction rule to be implement, implemented in the ozone non-attainment area. So what this means, I got to tell you. Gas tax. No. Mileage tax. No. What? It will shut you down. You cannot travel. You cannot hmm. use your car. They can tell you when and where you can use your car. Wow. I didn't even know it was that far. To travel. So this is the part. I mean, I saw this and, you know, like I saw reels on this and I see, I, I'm fascinated with, you know, conspiracy theory. And I saw something like this a few weeks ago in some other country and they were, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not ever really. And I remember that they had talked about it a little bit in legislation <laughs> before, but it was so aggressively shut down that they came up with some other thing, but there, there it is. This would prevent <laughs> this would prevent Coloradans from driving and somebody else gets to decide how many miles you drive in your car. And it doesn't say um, only for non-electric vehicles. It says a vehicle miles travel reduction rule. The rule wow. means there's no legislation on it. They Somebody else is deciding what that rule is. And it's there's nobody accountable. There's no... Um, there's no way to say, wait a second, I also need to take my mother to the doctor or F you guys, I'm leaving, I'm going out of state for a few days because you guys are crazy. Nope. This is Gestapo level bull crap. I can't even believe this is genuinely being, um, considered in the United States of America. So for those of you who are Coloradans, this is an attack on you. And if you're not in Colorado, if you think it can't happen, this is how it happens. Okay, that's my rant. <laughs> and Sarah, you're absolutely right. Um, the one thing I would mention is there is this feeling of tone deafness because this was already addressed over the last two years, mm -hmm. there was an attempt to do this in 2021. Um, workers spoke out loudly against this. And again, in 2022, it was raised. Again, it, the bill was defeated in the legislature. So I go back to my original point of what are we doing here? Because it seems that People have spoken out against these types of provisions already. We're not paying attention to what has already happened. We're not allowing businesses to comply. We're not allowing workers, apparently, to use their personal vehicles to do the things that they need to do, like pick up their child at 6 a.m. or 6 p.m. because they can't take light rail or their the bus doesn't run during those times or their child gets sick and they have to leave work to go pick them up. So these are all provisions that I feel like um, – it's very frustrating, right? Because you've seen this over and over and over again being discussed by the legislature, or even being discussed through the rulemaking process and being shut down, but yet we're seeing it again. So I'm going to ask you this question before we move on to the utility bill. And I've gone through this and I genuinely, and, and my board knows this. And by the way, the Action 22 board was very quick and they vehemently, they wanted me to say vehemently oppose this. There's nothing there. So I'm just going to say I've read through this um, several times, all 37 pages of it, looking desperately for something that was redeemable in this. And I could not find anything in this bill whatsoever that I thought was of any value, solved any solution, and wasn't an all-out attack on Coloradans and the in Colorado industry. 
Did you guys find anything that was positive in this bill? We aren't seeing any indication of how this is going to reduce ozone levels. Dan, I mean, do you feel differently? No, and I sort of flippantly said when we were asked the same question by a, a representative, and I said the the font is fine. <laughs> the bill number's fine. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, no. And it, I don't think it has any guarantee of any improvement in air quality. Okay. So I'm going to say. I, 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 know, I, know, I know a positive. Two okay. positives of it. All right. God it's, bless you. Uh, my kids are trying to figure out what they want to do for college and in the future. It's going to be a, a missions modeling or a lawyer. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Litigation Attorney Full Employment Act. So, yep. It's also the Paperwork uh, Paperwork Act. So here are, the prime, paper. here are the prime sponsors for this. Representative Jennifer Bacon, Jennifer or Jenny Wilford, Faith Winter, and Senator Julia Gonzalez. So I'm naming names. I'm not going to go through all of the people who have signed on to this. <sighs> We're not happy with you. All right, let's talk about the utility bill. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I, I said Gestapo level tactics. This one, uh, this adds to it. Um, and, and I don't apologize for that. I don't think it's hyperbole to say how many tr- miles you can travel is just that's le- first level. This one is second level. So let's, um, Will you, will you, uh, you've, you've reviewed the draft. I have not reviewed the draft, Dan. You can tell us a little bit more. Can you, um, uh, take this, us through that bill? Yeah, I'll do the best I can. There's a lot to this and it's not in my exact wheelhouse, but I'll, I can talk a little bit about it and what I know from it. Um, <clears throat> this is something that was born out of the joint select committee that Senate President Steve Fenberg put together on high uh, utility bills from, December, January, February of this year. And it's a very kind of populist thing to pull that group together and to talk about these high utility bills. And I am in no way making light of high utility bills. We all paid them and had to, to, you know, deal with that this winter. Um, but what this does is it, it, it's sort of that old, you know, adage of never let a crisis go to waste. And I will shorthand this in saying that this bill, if passed as written, would make it more difficult or more expensive for uh, some utilities to use natural gas to power homes in in Colorado, would make it easier to put solar uh, on your homes and make it easier for the affluent people who can afford solar to have other people pay for solar on their homes. Uh, It does things like eliminates the line extension allowance um for uh utilities right now that and so that would increase construction costs make homes less affordable in colorado which you know we're already doing uh it's already expensive to to live here uh that a limit the line extension allowance was already discussed at the puc and was killed there and so then it comes back in a bill like this and i think lauren will probably agree. This is what we're seeing a lot. Things that come up in rulemaking processes and are, you know, eliminated for whatever reason. They just don't work. And then that makes some people mad. And so then they cut paste and it ends up in a bill. And so this bill has not been introduced yet. And here we sit with less than three weeks to go. My concern from somebody who represents natural gas producers is you're making it you're making it difficult for us to get our product to market. Uh, if you're making it difficult for us to get a product to market and you're eliminating natural gas from the grid or making it harder to get it onto the grid, you're going to increase prices on people, not decrease prices on people. So I think this is another one of those bills that sets out to do something and will have the exact opposite effect. The reason bills went up last year or spiked were it was a supply and demand problem. There was not enough natural gas to go around the world, essentially. This is a globally traded commodity, not to get it in too far into the weeds here, but you've got Russia cutting off gas to Europe. Um, they desperately needed gas. Gas will kind of follow the highest price, right? So it's going to go to Europe. American gas saved the continent of Europe this winter. Uh, A lot of it goes to California where they are needing gas. So the price goes up because there's not enough of it. 
and then now it has eased. The winter wasn't as bad in some areas that that price has eased. We expect the cost of natural gas to kind of go back to where it was. And again, this is a tricky thing to predict gas prices and I don't do that, but everything I've read, it will go back to where it was for the past 10 years, which is an affordable source of energy for Coloradans. So I think that this bill is trying to solve something that was a you know difficult spike, um, but it's not going to bring down prices from what I've been able to tell. So just looking through the provisions of the bill, Dan, what did you see that would actually um, lower prices? If this was the intent of the bill, what was what provision of the of this draft would actually do that? I'm not sure that there's anything in here that does. And I think it also runs contrary to the state of Colorado's policy goals and, and energy agenda. You know, and it's it's really just a response to this short period of, of high natural gas prices. I don't think there's anything that actually you know, will stabilize or reduce costs for customers. There's other things that you can look at there. To, so utilities can avoid that price spike um, and allow them to maybe, you know, leverage those costs over a longer period of, of time. There are certain solutions, I think, that are out there, but this doesn't look to do to solve any of them. I think it's an opportunity to try to attack the source that really powers the grid in, in Colorado. I looked the other night, uh, Sunday night, eight o'clock, looked at public service. There's a great app called Electricity Maps. You can look anywhere in the world and see what's powering electricity in those different regions of the world. So you can look at public service Colorado, 77% of the power on the grid was fossil fuels, mostly natural gas. At that point, the sun had gone down, solar wasn't powering the grid, there wasn't a lot of wind. So where are we getting our power from right now? It remains coal, they're transitioning over to natural gas plants, but we need the we need these feedstock, we need you know natural gas to, to keep the grid viable. And I don't think it's, you know, in anybody's best interest to be attacking that as a, a source for our power, especially so this late in the game. This bill, and I'm going to get back to the late, the strategy of the late in the game um, for our listeners in just a moment. And also how this is a failure, the, their strategy is a failure to Coloradans as well. But does this bill, um, did you see anything with this bill that, um, does it support previous work or previous um, legislation that had gone through, or is it like uh, 1294 where it sort of demolishes what's all, the work that's already been done? I, I think it conflicts with the emission reduction policies that we've seen in previous uh, bills that have passed in, in other years. Uh, Senate Bill 236 from 2019, House Bill 1261 mm-hmm. from I think that same year. Uh, it conflicts with with those bills, as far as I can tell. There's a provision of this bill that makes me um, it makes me very nervous and very angry. And this is um, the part where utilities would be required to disclose individual information, including compensation, board participation, and other actions. I don't know what other actions mean for. All individuals that work at these companies. What? They what want the salaries it, listed of every individual at the utility companies. Not I just have the, no idea. What's the intent that of that? From, what the point of it is, other than to be punitive, to be scary, um, threatening? I have no idea. I've, that serves no purpose yeah. to me. Yeah, and this at is all. this is, and so the burden would be on utilities. So they would have to do every single year they would have to disclose compensation board participation and other actions for all individuals that work at these companies so is that like the janitor on up yeah everybody everybody oh, right. so if you sit on a board you sit on so what is this i mean what their is the purpose for I this believe. yeah their political, political giving is in there mm-hmm. and any kind of um, organizations that are that they give to Holy cow. How is that not Gestapo level? The intent here is to do, there's, I don't know how anybody could argue otherwise. I'd like to see them try. And if you would like to argue this provision with me, that this is otherwise what I've interpreted this as, this is to do damage, to cause damage to any of the employees. You don't need that information unless you're trying to cause them damage. So I've lived through that. 
so when you work for the Senate or the House, all of your your salary, all the money you make, all the money you spend, everything you do is public information. And over the years doing that, that was always used as harm in an election. It was always used like, you know, so-and-so pays his staffer or her staffer this much money. They spent this much money on food. And I mean, it was, it was out there. But, but those are public dollars that you yeah, were spending. Yeah, those, those that's what I was going to say. Those yeah. are public dollars. But looking back at it, it was never, I mean, it was good when you asked for a raise because you could look and say like, well, hey, by, by, you know, my equal over there is making sense. like 20,000 more a year than me. But, but just my experience with it, it was only used for harm or nefarious reasons. Yeah. But again, it's public dollars and that's part of the deal with it. So if you do that in the private industry, yeah, what yeah. do you think it's going to so be used one, for? So one bill, as far as Coloradans and how this directly affects you, there's nothing in this bill that would reduce or lower your costs. There's nothing that drives um, technology innovations with regard to other energy sources like hydrogen or geothermal or um, net uh, net zero emission natural gas, any of those things that we would that we would look for, um, mm-hmm. it makes it a whole other places, other states, other countries far more competitive. Um, and the provisions of this bill do nothing but damage. And I don't want to pay for some rich dude solar to be put up you know, in a town over or across the, the good neighborhood. Like, I don't want to pay for that. I don't want my power no. to go up because I can't the other put thing solar I'll add here. I'm sorry. Oh, I no, go ahead. You, but the other thing I'll add, when I talked earlier about sometimes when you're at the state house and a lot of them don't understand the world that exists outside of Colfax and, and Broadway, uh-huh. I think a lot of the policies that we see, it's really frustrating because they don't think about the most vulnerable among us. And right. those people who are making decisions about buying medicine, buying food, paying their rent, paying their utility bills, and they take actions that increase the costs on those people. If somebody wants to get solar, God bless you. Wonderful. I, I if have, you have I the resources, mind, yeah. And we need all energy, right, <laughs> at this point in, in our country and in the, in the world. We need everything. But we have to remember that not everybody can afford all of these things, mm-hmm. and you cannot punish the least vulnerable among us. So I, uh, I tell this story often, um, and I use myself for this reference. And um, I was speaking with uh, one of our board members, and they were in on that meeting. Um, what do you call it? The Fenberg's meeting with you guys about why, why gas select prices. Committee. What was it? Yeah. Joint Select Committee. The Joint Select Committee. I don't know what that means, but um, the Joint Select Committee. And I said, did anybody at any point during this discussion um, say it like it is, even though um, gas prices are going up, they um, electric is still more expensive? So I have an all-electric house, My and it's a, t- it's a little tiny house. It's a cottage house in the mountains. And my bill over the summer or over the winter was around $400 a month. My mom, who's on propane, natural gas and, um, and electric paid double and she hardly uses any electricity. It's like her lights and her TV and stuff. Her bill is twice what her gas bill is every month. And if she had to pay what I had to pay, there's, she'd be living with me, and then I'd be really coming after you people. <laughs> I would murder now somebody. Now we get to the bottom of it all. Now we get to the bottom so of it all. This is really about me and not having my mother have to live with me. But this is what we're talking about when we're talking about the most vulnerable people. And we keep adding burden and adding burden and adding burden. I do not understand um, really how they rationalize this in their head and that, that disconnect of – who are we actually serving? Um, and Action 22, this is our mantra. What matters most to those we serve and what do our communities need from us? I would I would just, if I could do anything, I would say, legislators, stop doing damage and ask those two questions. But first you have to answer who are you serving? Because this is not serving Coloradans. This is doing damage to Coloradans. And I, I think a good point of how this hurts the the lower end of the economic scale, you know, if you're 
utility bill goes up $20 in today's economic climate, that's like getting your kids to school or eating for another five days at the end of the month. Um, wages have not gone up. Uh, retirement has not gone up that match, you know, to match what it is and $20, you know, it's, it's funny cause you go to the, the food bank and I went to one the other day to help out and they were giving out $20 gift certificates, you know, the prepaid visa cards Oh yeah. and people were crying because that $20 was life or death for them. Like yeah, they had no food in the house, nothing, Yeah, nothing. Guys, I appreciate all the work you do, and I'm I'm really grateful that you came on the show and had this discussion. I'm going to leave it to you with final thoughts um, on this. I just appreciate what you're doing, Sarah. Thank you, you and Brian. Thank you for getting the message out. We need to get it out far and wide. Um, again, we should be very, very worried about Colorado's competitiveness right now, and looking at these types of laws or further deteriorating our business climate. And that is why we are going to fight this bill um, as as long as we need to. <laughs> and there's no ROI and it's inexcusable. Dan? I'll, I'll echo the same thing and thank everybody for the, the collaboration. We need to work hard on this because Colorado is, is worth protecting and, and having a, a good future here. And again, I, I said it earlier, we can have the, envi- the environment that we want and the economy that we need but we have to work together on it. All right, everybody. Um, uh, This is how we end our show. Um, Chad Borthman, I know you're listening and uh, you have big announcements that are coming out in the next couple days. We're really excited for you. It's already announced. Oh, is it? Yeah, I saw it on Facebook. Oh, you so did? it's public. Oh, Chad it's Borthman is leaving Colorado. I'm not happy about it. I'm not happy about it. <laughs> You're not happy about it. Um, we're happy for Chad, and we're really happy for Taylor, um, who's going to replace Chad. She is absolutely the best, um, the best uh, choice on that, and and we're really excited for her. And um, Chad's not going far, so he's going to still be serving um, in in his new role, and we couldn't. Uh, we we see it as an expansion of of our network in a really well, positive way. He was serving with his feet on the ground, and now he's up in the clouds. Yeah, Chad. Uh, he texted uh, he texted Brian earlier today. He's he's at my favorite thing. I would go to the space symposium, and I'm missing it this year because it's not relevant to what we do. <laughs> I mean, it, it is to a point, but it's expensive to go to. And, and yeah. I'm like, are you going to the space symposium? He's like, yep. I'm like, oh, you lucky. Mm. All right. <laughs> just, it's a fun meeting. It's a fun meeting. All right, yep. Brian, disclaimers. Um, the views and opinions expressed on making action happen do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Action 22 of its or its board or its membership, although I think you got a pretty I- good idea after this where Action 22 stands on it. Yes. And um, even though it's not an election season, there is one coming up locally. We do not endorse or directly support candidates, but we do give them a voice to come on our show and tell us what they're about. And with that in Pueblo, we're going to have maybe it's up in there, but a mayoral election soon. Um, Keep that's a, that's a whole, yep, yep. so <laughs> we're going to have the 28 candidates hopefully come on the show and say what they're about. Yep. So, all right, guys, thank you so much. Please share this episode. And if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, you can email those to show at action 22.org. We'll see you next time. Bye.